Hi, and thanks for watching the End Time Revival broadcast with Pastor Harold Smith. I'm your announcer, Jason Connors. The broadcast is recorded every Sunday morning at the Mark's First United Pentecostal Church, located on Academy Drive in Mark's, Mississippi. You can join the church for services every Sunday and Wednesday, or you can view past services at www.freegospelradio.com. This broadcast is made possible by the generosity of its viewers. You can help keep the broadcast going by sending your donation to Pastor Harold Smith, P.O. Box 373, Marks, Mississippi, 38646. Help us spread the word by mailing in your donation. And now, the End Time Revival broadcast with Pastor Harold Smith. Preacher with us this morning. Amen. And uh, hast thou 
not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of His understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increases strength. Isn't that wonderful? Let's give Jesus a clap on Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Uh -huh. The young men shall utterly fall. They're going to all do it. But listen to what he says. Wait but up. they that wait upon oh, the Lord oh, oh, yeah. ha -ha. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on. shall renew oh, their strength. Yeah. They shall mount up with wings yeah. as eagles. Yes. They shall run and not be weary. Yeah. They shall walk and not faint. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let's yeah. worship yeah. him. This promise is yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. hallelujah. Come on, let's just worship him a little bit this morning. Oh, he said, I have plans for you. He said, I have thoughts for you. Thank God. The Lord spoke a message yesterday. And over me, I had really had a bad day. And he said, I, I have you in the palm of my hand. And he said, no man shall pluck you out of my hand. For he said, I know the plans that I have for you. Oh, Isn't that an awesome God? Oh, Isn't that an awesome God? Yeah. Thank God. God. So let's praise him one more time. I want to see somebody get the Holy Ghost this morning. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. I want to see somebody get the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. said he'll never leave us nor forsake us but he said he'd go with us all the way thing you need to make sure is to get in the boat you need to get in the ship thank God you can sit here and enjoy our blessings and rub elbows with us but uh, and get right close to us and uh, my sister said soon as down in Louisiana she said soon as tribulation starts she's moving her trailer motorhome right next to me. I said, they ain't going to do you no good. You're going to, uh, I said, you you have to wait your turn. We got two or three others done. Said they move in that close. But uh, it, it uh, you know, we're just going to have to get in the ship. Amen. The Bible said, uh, Paul said, except these abide in the ship. You can't be saved. So we just got to get into the ship. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, sir. Thank God. I I got uh, three sermons I'm working on to preach to you. But I got one last night that's uh, the daddy of them all. And uh, I, I want to preach it to you one of these days soon. And uh, it's the cry of desperation. 
You know, till people get desperate with God, they're not going to ever cry to where he'll hear it. Amen. And you know, the Lord don't just hear. You know, everybody says, well, I'll pray. I, you know, I'll, I'll pray a little bit. And I'd, but the Lord don't hear all that stuff. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I believe God hears everybody. You better go back and check your Bible. The Bible said, how be it? He heareth not a sinner's prayer. Except when you're crying out in repentance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Everybody say praise the Lord. Everybody say praise the Lord. I hope some of you really get into this and, and let God know that you love Him. Amen. You know what? You're fortunate to be here this morning. Amen. The hospitals are full. The nursing homes are full. Hallelujah. But God has allowed you to be sitting here this morning. So why wouldn't you worship Him with all of your heart?
my extreme pleasure this morning to turn this part of the service over to our son, Daniel, Brother Daniel Smith. Amen. So, everybody say, God bless Brother Daniel. God bless Brother Daniel and Jesus. Let's give the Lord a good hand, shall we? It's so good to be in the house of God this morning. Amen. Yes, it is, brother. Such a privilege to be here. I, I honor and respect my dad very highly. He is my mentor and best friend. We shared a lot together, and uh, God is awfully good to us to give us parents that love God. Amen. Believe God for healing, and I am, I'm indebted today to my dad and my mom. Bless him, Lord. Bless amen, him. amen. So good to be in Marks, Mississippi. It's a delight and an honor every time I get to come, whether dad's here or, or he's out and he trusts me in this podium to preach to you. I count it an honor to be here. You're some wonderful people. You love God. And uh, I was telling someone at the hospital yesterday, uh, without fail, you always, always respond to the message, to the call of God. And um, I said, they always come up and say how much they enjoy the message. I said, maybe we need to preach on a lying spirit, but uh, uh, we thank you so kindly because you're so kind. Amen. I heard a story about a kindergarten teacher was having a show and tell uh, assignment for the class. Each student was instructed to bring an object to share with the class and to represent their religion. One boy stood up and he said, I'm, uh, my name is Benjamin, I'm Jewish, and this is the Star of David. The second student got up in front of the class and said, My name is Mary, I'm Catholic, and this is a rosary. The third student stood up in front of the class and said, My name's Tommy, I'm Pentecostal, and this is a casserole. <laughs> Amen. I think sometimes associated with religion and Pentecost always has to do with food. Amen. But I thank God today for the honor, again, of being here and feel the presence of the Lord. I won't keep you long. Daddy asked me to sing two songs. I was trying to get him to sing with me, but um, I don't think he's going to do that this morning. I'd like to dedicate these to two of the finest people that I know. And uh, my uncle and aunt from Louisiana that listens to the broadcast all the time. And uh, Aunt Sippy, Uncle R.C., this goes to you today. God bless you. Oh, my way. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I am so delighted to be here again with you. I guess we'll do this one last song, Brother Randy. Daddy requested it. Amen. And then we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and turn in our Bibles, if you would, to Luke 23, 13. Just going to give you what he gave me. Come on, brother. Come on. Luke 23, 13 says, And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. 
We're talking about the Lord here when the Lord was brought to before Pilate. Yes, sir. And he said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people. And behold, I have examined him before you and found no fault in this man, touching those things where you have accused him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent him unto Herod, or I sent him unto him. And lo, nothing is worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city, and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again unto them. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him, and I will therefore chastise him and let him go. I want you to notice right there, he said unto them the third time, I find no fault in him. I'm going to let him go and chastise him. But they, and the Bible says in the 23rd verse, and they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison whom they had desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. I made mention a minute ago that he said for the third time, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. I'm going to chastise him and let him go. Pilate was at the very brink Come on, brother. of letting Jesus go. He was almost persuaded to let him go. Come on, that's it. And today I want to preach on the tragedy of almost. The tragedy of almost tragedy of almost. Would you bow your head with me right now and as we pray and ask God to just take over this service. God, I thank you today for the power of the Holy Ghost. I thank you for those that are here today. Those that need to feel your touch. I pray, God, that you would lighten their load. Give them strength today. Those that are in need of a touch from you, I pray that you would walk up and down the aisles of the sanctuary and touch them and give them a mighty touch. Those that are here today and they're not ready to meet you. I pray, dear God, that they won't say almost uh, that I was persuaded, almost uh, that I came to that altar, God, but I pray that they'll make up their mind to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Shake hands before you're seated and welcome everyone here again to the house of the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. It is about 23 minutes till 11, and I promise you I'm not going to hold you long, but I do want to deliver what I feel in my spirit today. Three times, three times Pilate was talking to the people, but Pilate never did do what was right. Three times he said, I find no fault with this man. I'm just going to chastise him and leave him and let him go. But he listened to the people of his congregation or those that were there in Jerusalem. A poet once wrote, of all words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these it might have been. If that's true, then one of the most tragic words in human language must be the word almost. Almost speaks of aborted opportunity and mischances. I'm sure that as long as this world exists, almost will dot the pages of human history. I almost climbed that mountain. We almost reached our goal. And I almost closed that deal. We almost got there in time. We've all had those almost experiences in our life. I almost done what I was supposed to do. I almost went down to the altar when the preacher preached to me. I almost was under conviction enough to get up out of my seat and go pray. I almost made up my mind that I was going to live for God. I almost made up my mind 
that I was going to change my way and make Jesus number one in my life. This world is full of people that are saying almost, almost, almost. But this morning we may not run and dance and shout, but I hope today that I can talk to you about a subject that's going to be so important in your walk with God. I almost got up out of the bed and went to church this morning. I almost got up and, and did the things that I needed to do in order to live for God. I almost prayed yesterday. I almost prayed the day before. But something came in my way. There's going to be times in your walk with God that you're not going to feel like praying. There's going to be times in your walk with God that you're not going to feel like doing what God's asking you to do. You know the reason why is the Bible says that the flesh and the spirit are at enmity with each other. They're not going to let you relax and live for God and be an overcomer because the devil don't want you to live for God. The devil don't want you to be blessed. The devil don't want you to live in victory. So he's going to attack your mind. He's going to attack your body. He's going to attack you in every way. But you've got to make up your mind that you're going to live for God. That you're going to go on the home to heaven and to get your reward. One of these days when we get to heaven, the Bible says that we're going to understand it all better in the by and by. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, uh, I, I really wasn't going to say a lot about it, but uh, in uh, Tri Lakes Hospital in Batesville, there is a lady in room 131 that made up her mind many, many years ago that I'm not going to almost get there. The race is, is going to be long, but I'm going to make up my mind that I'm going to live for God. And all of these years, she lived for God. Yes, Hallelujah. I don't know how many years ago it was. I know dad and mom's been married 52 years. Uh, so it was several years beyond that that she received the baptism of the Holy Ghost uh, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Uh, and it absolutely changed her life. She was raised up in another denomination where her parents did not believe this. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard the story before. But her mother would make her put on uh, makeup and stuff uh, that she did not feel like she needed to wear anymore. But uh, when she would leave, uh, she would wipe it off and go to church uh, and live for God. But when she'd come back home, her mother would slap her jaws and put it right back on there. She would read the Bible underneath the covers of her bed. She had a made up mind that I'm going to live for God in no matter what circumstances. I love my mother. I love my daddy. But I love my Jesus most of all. If you get a made up mind, you won't ever say, I almost was persuaded. Come on, brother. Come on. Amen. The tragedy of almost. I was talking to someone the other night. We began to talk about the Word of God. The power of God. Young man in my church that's preached for y'all many times, Brother Justin Hill, was talking in youth service the other night. And he, he and I began to share before, but he told the young people, he said, I promised God a long time ago when I lived my made up my mind to live for him. I started preaching when I was 13, he said. And I promised God that I would live for him. And I had such a zeal, such a desire to do something for God. And he said, now that I'm 22 and I'm still preaching and I'm married, he said, I still want that desire. And I told God in prayer the other day, give me the freshness, give me the zeal, give me the desire like I used to have when I first fell in love with you. Oh, come on, amen. That's it, brother. Sometimes the road gets long. Anybody ever took a trip and traveled a lot of long, many miles? The road gets long and weary. Yes, sir. Last come year on. we took the youth to the Smoky Mountains, and that's a good little piece down there. Yes, sir. And ever so, ever a few miles, how long have we got? 
How long have we got to get there? I said, a long time. And we'd get to traveling, we'd get to traveling, they'd get restless. How long we got? Oh, we still got several hours to go. And you know one thing, the road may get long on this earth that we trod. It may seem like you've been living for God a long time. And you may feel like that you're all alone and by yourself. That you can't live for God unless God reaches down and touches you. Let me tell you something, honey. You can live for God. Because the Bible says you and him is a majority. Yeah. If you got Jesus in your life, you got the majority on your side. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's it. Come on, brother. Hallelujah. Brother and Selmy Cajun from Louisiana preached a message one time. The island of by you self. <laughs> Amen. You may feel like you want to buy you, but and that by you is by yourself. But when you've got Jesus, it don't matter if you're on an island by yourself or, or you're in a crystal cathedral with 5,000. Jesus is going to be there. He said, where the name of Jesus is, I'm going to show up in their midst. Amen. He said, where two or three that are gathered together in my name, there I will be in their midst. You may not have many today, but if you can just get a vision of what God has for you, but it can't be almost we had revival. Almost I want to pray. We've got to make up our mind that I want a revival more than I want life itself. Yes, hallelujah. 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 Sometimes we come in from work. Let me, can I get personal for just a minute here? I, I, I work I get up at 4.45 sometimes when I don't hit the snooze button. I get up around 5 o'clock in the morning and no matter how late I went to bed and I get up and I go to work. And if you get up and you go to work and it's dark and you come home and it's dark, it's a long day. Amen. And then you get your clothes on and go to church after getting dressed. I'm going to tell you something. You don't feel like it sometime to go to church. You've been working all day and the old devil tells you they can make it without you today. Hey, let me tell you something, devil. It ain't just a matter of them making it without me. I can't make it without the church. I need God more than I need anything else in this world. If I don't have money in my pocket, if I don't have food on my table, i got to have God more than I need anything in this world. Hallelujah. The Bible says don't forget to forsake themselves together and even more so as you see the second coming of the Son of Man. We don't just need to come to church. We better be in church to get something from God. I don't want to come and just give. I want to come and receive. I you wonder why we promote worship. You wonder why we promote singing and worshiping God. It's because you're going to need this when you get home. You're going to need the touch of God in your spirit when you get to work tomorrow. You're going to need something from God. Yes. And if all you do is just come to church and sit there like Elijah the wooden Indian and nothing you can take and nothing you're going to give. Just leave me alone. I'm here. I'm doing my own thing. No sorry. You need to get something from God. You need to put something into it so that you will walk out the doors of this service and tomorrow you'll be blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If a baby's growing up and he gets the milk, he gets all the vitamins from the mother, we give him what he needs, but when he gets to be five or six years old, he don't need the Bible anymore. I don't need it at one. But uh, the baby gets to where he's got to start eating good food. Yes, sir. But if we took him off the bottle and the nutrients from the mother gives him, and all of a sudden we just open the canister and say, here's a bunch of potato chips. Here's all the, all the donuts and the cookies you want. Just just have yourself a bottle of Coca-Cola and refrigerator. He's not going to eat something that's going to be good for him. We as Christians, we got to have something of the Word. we got to eat on the Word of God. The Bible says, I have prepared a table before you in the wilderness. Can God feed you? Yes, He can feed you when the going gets rough. My God will provide you a table. Don't worry about where it's coming from. Just live for God. Come on, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Some people, they get in church and they start wondering, what am I going to do? How am I going to live for God? What is my friends going to say? I tried to tell a young man one time, 
He talked about, you know, his friends are going to think he's gone plum loco. And I told him, I said, in this case, you don't worry about what your friends say. That's it, amen. Come on. Because see, at the end of the time, when the books of life are open, and God's going to take notice, and he's going to go down through that list, and he's going to say, is Jody Jones' name there? And when Brother Jones, when you stand before God, when he goes down there, and he looks and he says, I see your name. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. That's going to be worth everything. It's going to be worth every long life. It's going to be worth every heartache and every try. It's going to be worth it all. Just as we hear him say, well done. That's it, brother. Come on. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. But when that book of life is open, Brother Jones, and he goes down through that list, and he looks out and he says, sorry, I never knew you. Oh, God, what a horrible thing. Oh, God, what a horrible thing. God. That gives me nightmares. I don't ever want to stand before God and hear Him say, I never knew you. Amen. Some people are confused about Him saying, I never knew you. What about the backsliders that knew God and they went away? God knew Him. He wasn't saying, Brother Jones, I knew you in the sense of, I know your name and I know who you are. But he was saying that word knew was an intimate relationship. You used to one time had a relationship with him. You used to love him. You used to call upon his name. But now you're backslid. Now you're going out. And he says, I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. I don't want to hear him say, my son, cast out into everlasting darkness. There's a place prepared for you. Hallelujah. Almost. The tragedy of almost. I had chances. I had opportunity. The preacher gave the altar call. The preacher said, come pray. The most important time in your life is right now. Yes, sir. Amen. Come on. And I walked away. Almost. I was so close to God. Almost. The book of Acts, we read in the 26th chapter, I believe where Paul's talking to King Agrippa. He'd been talking to him and he's preaching to him. Acts 27, verse number 29, King Agrippa said, Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost. Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. The most sad words that Grippo could have ever uttered. He was a king. He had everything he ever wanted. But almost you persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul told him, said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together such as I am. Accept these bonds. Oh, yes. Amen. Friend, if you're listening to me today, if you're in this church and you're hearing my voice by the way of the internet, I'm trying to tell you something this morning. If you say almost to God, God's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me. You worker of iniquity. That's it. Come on. Be cast into outer darkness. Jesus name. Almost. Almost. Thou persuadest me. To be a Christian. Pilate was looking into the eyes. Of the mercy. Of Jesus Christ. And he said. I find no fault with this man. That's it. Come on. Chastise him and let him go. That's it, brother. Come on. Said it again when they began to cry out. Crucify him. Why? He asked the question, why? That's it. He's Come on. done no wrong. That's it, brother. Come on. Two times. The third time, the Bible says he gives in to the people. The most feared thing especially in young people's life today, is the giving in to peer pressure. That's 
That's it, brother. Come on. The world's doing it, Dad. Everybody's doing it. We might as well. Every church is doing this. Every church can go there. We might as well do it. Almost. Almost. Come on, brother. That's it. Amen. In the name of Jesus. There's not going to be an almost that's going to get to heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not going to preach long. I felt like God told me to tell somebody that's listening in the sound of my voice that you're so close to giving your heart to God. Come on. You're so close. You love this church. You love this people. You love to feel the power of God. But I come to tell you, you're not promised tomorrow. No man is promised tomorrow. Come on, brother. I'm sure you've heard this story. Daddy was preaching in Millington, Tennessee back when I was just a teenager. There was a guy that was real popular in high school. Everybody knew him. And one night, one of the boys in our church had invited him, just told him, man, we're having church, you want to come? And he was, he was one that they considered cool and ran with the crowd. Him and his girlfriend came that night on their motorcycle and they got in the church there and the power of the Holy Ghost began to fall and Dad began to preach under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and conviction set in that young man's heart and he was at the point of decision. What do I do? Almost. He was almost coming to the altar. When he got mad and he got up and he walked out. Stomped out the door of the church. And he was so noticeable because he tried to go out the exit that's with the alarm set off on it. And the door was, he couldn't get it open. And so everybody watched him as they went out the door, him and his girlfriend. But it was so sad for about two or three hours later, a man that was driving under the influence of alcohol came over on his side of the road and hit him and his girlfriend head on. And they went out to be in eternity without God. Almost. He was so close. So close. So close. At the door of eternity. And we don't even realize when we're so close. So close. Brother Randy, as you begin to play, I'm, I'm finishing up. The Bible says the stripes were placed upon his back for our healing. The blood he shed was for you and I for forgiveness of sin. The crown of thorns was placed upon his head. Those soldiers grabbed him and they hit him. They mocked him. They spit on him. Plucking up at his beard. As he began to carry that cross down the streets of Jerusalem. He couldn't bear the weight of the cross. The cat of nine tails that they used to whip him tore the flesh from his back, exposing the bone and the sinew, the muscle. Blood flowing down his back. Those yes, thorns that they had braided into a crown and shoved them down on his precious head. The blood flowing down his face. couldn't bear the weight of the cross so Simon Cyrenian they pulled him out of the crowd and let him bear the cross when they got to Galgotha's hill there they laid him down on that wooden cross taking those spikes they begin to nail they begin to nail my Jesus flesh <laughs> man that never did anything but good healed the blind the withered the lame the halt oh God raised up the dead called Lazarus back from the dead after four days stopped the, the funeral procession of the widow of Nain gave her son back to life. Nothing but good had he ever done. Pilate was saying, I find no fault with this man. Because the cross
crowd kept crying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He gave in to the people. Almost! He had a chance to release my God. Almost, almost, almost. As the nails began to pound into his feet and his hands. for you. They come by with their seer, a sword. They poked him in the side. The Bible says blood and water flow. And you and I, sometimes we can't see the whole picture. All we can see is the peer pressure of the world that says, you don't need to do that. You don't need to go there. The bigger picture says there's a cross that he died on. There's the blood that he shed for me. The bigger picture says there's a heaven and there's a hell. There's no in between. Which one am I going to? Oh, I'm a good person. I know that. But the Bible says there's a plan. There's a way that seemeth right unto man. But the end thereof is destruction. The Bible says there's a plan. You must repent of your sins. You must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. You must be baptized in the only saving name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Buried in a watery grave of baptism to rise in the newness of life and to speak in other tongues. If you've not repented of your sins, not been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God is saying, I sent someone to you to tell you today. Almost. It's not going to get it. The tragedy of almost. Would you stand with every eyes closed, every head bowed? I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I feel the presence of God. Conviction is gripping your heart right now. If you feel God tugging at your heart strings, I wouldn't walk out the door of this church until I come down to this altar and I begin to pray. Almost! May find you begging for God to forgive you. Almost may find you battling the flames of hell. If you walk out the door of this church, you're not guaranteed that you'll ever Come back again. In the name of Jesus. Let's begin to pray, shall we? Let's pray right now. Jesus' name. By the power of the Holy Ghost. God, I presented them with what you gave me. The tragedy of almost. Anybody want to come pray? These altars are open right now. They're open right now. Come pray. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. God's touching hearts. These are our altars. We need to be ready. 